everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Sambella, and I'm uh, communicating with you today from my natural habitat here at the Alfred Wegener Institute in northern Germany. I, my passion, number one, among other things, is in fact uh, logging and cutting down trees, splitting wood, harvesting, and uh, uh, using it to, uh, to feed the fire to, to keep us warm in the winter. But I, I don't want to, to give you the impression that this is only uh, uh, a deleterious activity that uh, we do against the, the forests. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm bi, and I say bi in the sense of bicontinental because uh, I have a, a forest here in Germany to manage and uh, also a small forest in Nova Scotia. And I'm trying now to do uh, what I call sustainable harvesting, logging, and really using these two small forests as a kind of a test bed to see how this can be accomplished. So I'm, I'm very careful about what I do now. In my younger days in British Columbia, I worked for almost two years as a commercial logger. And at that time, we, we essentially clear-cutted the, the forests. And uh, this was in the, in the 70s and, and early 1980s. And now when I think about that, uh, I realize that we were not really concerned about carbon footprint. We were just concerned about uh, whether there would be any trees left at the end of all of this. So what I, I did after my uh, logging time, I started thinking about this and I thought maybe in order to do penis, I should uh, take my next job as a tree planter. So I, I went back to, to the same areas of forest from these clear cut areas and uh, got involved in a tree planting operation. And I roughly calculate that I, I probably planted four times as many trees as I cut down. So I, I think maybe I've done my, my penance. So as I say, I keep this as one of my passions to, to try to do sustainable harvesting of the, the forest. But uh, living in the country also has another advantage for my personal life and passions. And I come to my second one, which is motorcycling. I've been a, an avid motorcyclist for uh, almost 50 years now. And uh, fortunately in the country, I have a big barn which allows me to store my five motorcycles. And uh, before you all uh, recall and horn say, why do you need five motorcycles? And I always uh, say, well, how many pairs of shoes and boots do you have? You need a, a different motorcycle for different things. So now I have uh, three old BMWs from the 1970s. I have a, a, essentially a racing machine, a Ducati, and a, a sport touring Honda. And all of these are ridden uh, frequently. They're all in mechanical working order. And uh, I do enjoy them all. So I'm not, I'm not a collector. I'm not trying to just have a lot of motorcycles. I really want to enjoy them. And uh, maybe just as an example of, of one of the things that, uh, that I managed to fulfill on my, my bucket list, this is a few years ago now, I managed to take uh, uh, one of these bikes on, on the Nür Nürburgring, the old racetrack, the, the Green Hell or the Nordschleife, which is a long twisty racetrack. Of course, I wasn't racing against anybody, only against myself, but it was one of the more exciting experiences of my life. I do have one more thing on my motorcycle bucket list, uh, and that's uh, to take my Ducati uh, back home on a tour through the Alps to Bologna, uh, and then uh, down the Amalfi Coast. And I think uh, once I do that, it, it might be time to, uh, to uh, 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 dispense with the Ducati, because uh, I'm probably not much fit uh, for it as a, a racing bike. Maybe my third passion, which I could not have imagined even 15 years ago, which is that I've now become a small scale shepherd. I have um, uh, a dozen uh, Heidschnucken. This is a special race of sheep uh, with horns. They are very robust, um, actually coming from the Lunenburger Heide, which is uh, nearby in Northern Germany. These are sheep that uh, live outside all year round. They, they need only uh, modest shelter in the, in the winter. They can tolerate minus 15, minus 20 degrees. Um, and they can live off relatively poor vegetation, which is essentially the case in, in most of the moor. Um, but 
I, I just wanted maybe to, to tell you that uh, when I go home after a, a hard day in the, at the Abbey, uh, where I'm, I'm sort of hanging on as, a, as an emeritus uh, professor, um, and I'm very frustrated because nobody's listening to me anymore, or uh, uh, I had some frustrating encounter with, uh, uh, with a publication or some experiments or colleagues, I go home and I greet my sheep and I take my, my staff and I just wander out in the middle of the moor field and they all come. And I feel sometimes like, a, like an Old Testament prophet. As it turns out, coincidentally, I have exactly 12 sheep. So maybe they're like the apostles, not quite sure. But I can just tell you that these sheep give me such a, a feeling of, of inner peace uh, and they pay attention, which is uh, <laughs> which is probably not the case with uh, with most of uh, of uh, my my friends and colleagues anymore. So as long as I have these sheep, I, I feel I'm uh, I remain connected with uh, with my environment and nature, and uh, I will know that at, at least I always have some followers. I'll just recount very quickly. Three things, they're not necessarily great to everybody, but they were to me. And um, the first one was uh, during my doctoral studies, which I, I started in the, in the early 1980s. And I picked a topic, which is to look at genetic variation in Alexandrium, a species complex. And uh, I adopted this genetic approach involving uh, basically very primitive proteomics, which was essentially unknown at the time, using enzyme electrophoresis and toxin profiling. I worked and worked and worked in the laboratory, I mean, day and night and on the weekends, you can't believe I was there all the time. And for almost a year and a half, I worked on trying to get the proteomic profiles to work. Totally unsuccessful. Day after day, I reran those polyacrylamide gels, tried new staining techniques, no success. Finally, after almost a year and a half, my thesis committee said, Alan, don't you think it's it's about time that you, you gave up on this? I mean, try something else. Your toxin work is going along fine, but you really shouldn't do this anymore. You're, you're, you're probably beating your head against the wall. And I essentially ignored them, <laughs> continued, tried a few new tricks, and Eureka one day suddenly had beautiful enzyme profiles. And that was really the, the highlight uh, of my, uh, my PhD thesis, which, which was really persisting against this uh, technological impediment. I, I'm still not quite sure how I did it, but it, it was somewhat of a serendipitous discovery. Um, the, the next one that, that I'm sort of proud of is, is many years later, when we were looking for the biological source of spirolides in shellfish in Nova Scotia, and uh, uh, we managed to locate it. It was something in the plankton. And I went out there with uh, my technician and we pumped enormous quantities of seawater through a 20 micron mesh net and collected all this plankton material and then looked at it under the microscope and tried to figure out what, what in there could be producing these uh, spirolides. And we kept noticing that there were these round globular uh, sort of golden colored uh, uh, cells, and but we couldn't figure out what they were. I was convinced they were probably a dinoflagellate. We did some pigment analysis and proved out, yes, they had dinopigments, had a U-shaped nucleus, and I said, oh, it's probably a goniolakai dinoflagellate, but we didn't know what it was. There were no gene probes in those days. So we persisted and persisted and uh, essentially got nowhere with it, and I think people in the institute got Tired, they said, oh no, Sambella is going to keep talking about his golden balls. Uh, we didn't have a name to put on it. And anyway, one day, actually, my technician managed to get some cells that had a thin veil of a theca. And that was the breakthrough. We found out, yes, those theca plates, that's Alexandrum Ostenfeldi. So I was really proud of, uh, of our work, uh, myself, and, and special credit to Nancy Lewis, my technician who uh, finally was uh, uh, alleviated from the responsibility to me uh, talking about golden balls. We finally had a name to put on it. Uh, maybe in a, on a very personal note, uh, my, my greatest triumph, if I can say this, actually happened as a response to a, a massive uh, accident that I had. 
now 12 years ago where I actually fell down inside the ballast water tanks of a ship. <laughs> I won't go into the long story, but the short story is that I fell seven meters to the bottom of the ship with massive brain injury and was for a while, it wasn't clear that I was actually going to survive uh, much less with, with any higher brain functions left. But I, sp I spent five months in a, in a neurological rehabilitation center where I tried against all odds to essentially restructure my brain from the inside. I became more or less my own neuropathology subject and actually did in situ experiments on my own brain and became a, a, a devotee of this idea of neuroplasticity, that it is possible to, to rebuild the neural connections in your brain and actually become functional again. And this was against all the advice and counsel of the neurologist. They thought probably I should just rest and not waste my time trying to uh, restructure my brain. But anyway, I got out of there five months later, again, against their advice. And the triumph actually came when I went upstairs to my, to my study at home. On, on my bookshelf, there was a, a manuscript. It was actually a proposal for the first Greenland cruise uh, to West Greenland. I had written this, not alone, but with colleagues, more than 50 pages proposal. And with shaking hands and sweaty palms, I pulled this off the shelf because I wanted to see if I could even understand what it is that I'd written. Would I, would I even know what it was all about? And I was incredibly relieved to find that, yes, I un understood everything that I wrote, but I couldn't imagine that I was the person that wrote it. In other words, I didn't know the why. So I guess for me, the, the greatest challenge of my life has been to, to since then, to reconstruct my, my brain in a way that I'm at least quasi-functional. I still have five dead zones, but I've been able to compensate in most ways. And you see me here today, 12 years later, uh, I'm able to walk, talk, uh, chew gum, and uh, even I do have a microscope beside me. I, I know what it's used for and I know how to use it. So for me, this was was really a, a personal challenge that I managed to overcome with, with some scientific consequences. And so I'll, I'll give you one, but it's a funny story that's reflexive upon how stupid and blind I could be, right? So I'm, I'm really uh, being very self-critical here in being sort of blinded by, by dinos. I, I was of the mind at that time uh, that, that uh, toxins were produced, uh, at least the known ones, were produced mostly by dinoflagellates. And everything else was toxic or undefined. And it was right in the middle of the 1987 uh, domoic acid crisis. Before we knew it, it was domoic acid. People were in hospital. We had a national task force with international participants and all the conference calls were called by the chemists. Okay, what, what is it that's causing the mice to behave strangely? What is it that made the people sick? And they were all focusing on maybe it's heavy metals, maybe it's pesticide residues, maybe it's some kind of organic contaminants. And I said, as kind of biologist, I said, but, but I think the ideology of this thing, it, it looks more like it might be something that as some organism that these mussels are eating. And they looked at me a bit quizzically. They said, well, okay, if you think that, see what you can find out. So I got some samples, netto samples from uh, Cardigan Bay sent to me and spent a few days looking under the microscope to see what was in these water samples. And as I was looking under the microscope, I was wading through forest of chain forming penny diatoms, okay? And I was basically ignoring all this because everybody knew that diatoms are not toxic. They're food for copepods, right? Good food for mussels, not toxic. And I focused on two cells of pericentrum that I found in the bottom of, of the uh, counting chamber. And then I got excited. Maybe, maybe this is the source of these new uh, mystery toxins. Well, as it turned out, I was obviously completely blinded because I ignored 98% of the biomass only because I was convinced that it couldn't be these chain-forming uh, penate diatoms that could be the cause. Well, 
uh, I had some discussions with my friend and colleague Steve Bates, and, and Steve said to me, uh, wh why don't we culture some of this stuff here, these diatoms, and see if they make toxins? And I went, duh, yeah, but probably not, right? So Steve went away and did this, and of course, I, I lost my claim to fame because of my blindness. I was simply blinded by, uh, by my preconceived notions. So if I had some advice, keep an open mind on these things. Always look for the most plausible explanation. Don't ignore the obvious. And, uh, as you can imagine, living on a farm, uh, I would say uh, I don't really have pets, but I do have domestic animals, two uh, lovely cats that spend most of their time outside and are really responsible for uh, keeping down the, the field mouse uh, population. Without them, we would be completely overrun, if you can imagine, with uh, various kinds of grains and seeds and, and garden plants and, and whatever. Also the hay fields. And I won't want to use the cliche, uh, follow your dreams, even though essentially that's what I, what I did. Because uh, when I applied to graduate school at the University of British Columbia in Oceanography, I met with the Oceanographic uh, Department advisor, and he said to me, so you want to be an oceanographer, why? And I gave him the usual blah, 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 I've always loved the oceans and marine life, whatever. And he told me, he said, forget about it. He said, you, do you know the possibility that you will actually become an oceanographer? You know that right now in the United States, there are 300 applicants for every position in oceanography. I said, why don't you, you come from Prince Rupert, right? Why don't you go and become a commercial fisherman if you really like the ocean? That's where the money is, right? Well, it turned out that 10 years later, uh, because I ignored his advice and <laughs> went to graduate school anyway in oceanography, uh, I invited him on one of my cruises in British Columbia, and I told him that the six uh, salmon canneries in Prince Rupert were now closed. The fishing industry was totally devastated. <laughs> I was really glad that I ignored his advice to become uh, an oceanographer. Uh, so I think it, the, the important point here is that, you know, if you're really motivated to do something, don't let practical realities discourage you. You will find a way through. And if it's not that important to you, then, then find something else. Uh, maybe the, the next point is uh, lear learn to set priorities. This is what I would have tol uh, told my younger self. It's fine to be curiosity driven. I, want, I was so interested in everything that I, in many respects, never stud studied anything in sufficient detail to draw any firm conclusions. So now my advice would be, operate like a like a battlefield surgeon by by triage you know you're you're on the battlefield i'm going to use the analogy here you have the, the the dead soldiers those are those projects and proposals that are either too late or won't get funded or they're absolutely impossible they're gone don't waste your time worrying about them just leave them alone on the other end of the spectrum like the battlefield surgeon the lightly wounded you know, the ones with the finger cut and whatever. These are the, the little details. Ignore those. Let somebody else do them. And if, in fact, if they're not done, it's probably not going to affect the outcome of things to any great magnitude anyway. So focus on the severely wounded. That's the things where you really need to apply your expertise to answer the, the key questions where you can really feel part of the, the core of the project or the program. And maybe I'll just finish up with, with one bit of advice that I wish I'd given myself 20 years ago. It's really important to take your, your science seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. I, I really had a, a serious problem in, in thinking that, you know, you, you have to be a nerd in science and, and act like a nerd in science. And sometimes it's important just to take a look at yourself from another perspective and learn Learn to laugh, learn to appreciate the stupid things that you do and be a little indulgent. And you'll find it it's much easier to deal with colleagues that are hypercritical of you if you can learn to appreciate your own foibles and your own mistakes. So I'm, I'm going to sign off now uh, and just uh, wish you all well in your, in your future careers. Two high notes that we need to address. I won't be around for most of this, but biodiversity, 
climate change. Obviously, they're settled science insofar as whether they're actually happening, but the impacts and effects and consequences on harmful algal bloom species and bloom dynamics is very much a completely open field. So I, I leave it to you to, to follow on in my rather ragged footsteps uh, along with other senior colleagues and, and wish you well in your endeavors. Cheers. <laughs>